sense in which we're already doing what uh, I'm talking about today, so good job. Love it when God goes ahead of you. Uh, we put the first photo up, please, Phil. Uh, in the late 1940s, the population of Lewis, the remote island in the Outer Hebrides, was only 25,000 people. It was a place steeped in religious and Celtic beliefs with many nominal Christians, um, but young people were completely absent from the church. Uh, now, this was, unlikely place was the backdrop to one of the most significant outpourings uh, in recent times of God moving. So in 1949, in what seemed to come out of absolutely nowhere, the island and many of the surrounding islands were impacted significantly by an awakening uh, that God brought. God moves powerfully and sovereignly in that whole area. Suddenly people who'd never set foot in church before were crying out to God in the middle of fields and crying out for forgiveness for their sins. There was 400 people gathered at a police station just there to cry out to God. People walked 12 miles across the moors just to get to church. If you walked or drove along the roads in those years, you would find people just at the sides of the roads and across the fields, just on their knees in prayer to God. Church services would spontaneously fill. Nobody would advertise or tell people they were happening. People would just show up at church buildings in their hundreds. Sometimes the crowds were there waiting for the minister to open the doors. It was described as though like the air on Lewis was just filled and saturated with the presence of God. Now, Duncan Campbell was the, the minister who was most connected with the events uh, on Lewis. He later described revival as a community saturated with God. There seemed to be so much spontaneous and kind of um, an, a sovereign act of God about the Lewis awakening. And for three years, it continued. People gave up their trips to the pub and the dance halls were turned into prayer rooms. Pubs had to close because nobody was going anymore um, and the prayer meetings were just breaking out all over the place. Now, it was in those days it took seven hours by boat to get to the mainland, which somewhat dampened the impact here on mainland Scotland. But the impact locally was huge. Many, many young people came to faith and for many of them, they became missionaries that were then sent out around the world or became ministers in churches. Lots of lives were forever changed in those short three years. Now, I hadn't been on Lewis uh, until 2019 when a friend and I went to a prophetic conference. We have uh, friends who lead an amazing church on Stornoway, uh, St. Martin's Memorial Church, is led by Tommy and Donna McNeil. Um, and... It's an amazing place. If you've never been to Lewis, then it's, it's definitely worth a visit. It's scenic, it's remote, it's kind of uh, rugged, but it's, it's beautiful. We toured when we were there in 2019, we toured some of the revival sites, uh, the places where God had moved. There was a, there's a cottage where they had a prayer meeting and as they had the prayer meeting, the whole cottage shook and we kind of drove past that and we saw that. Uh, and in the next picture we've got here, this is Barvis Church Building. It's kind of like almost in the middle of nowhere uh, with like a few houses by it. This was the center of what happened on Lewis in, that, in those days. Uh, this kind of random, not, nothing much to look at church was the center of what God was doing. There's, in a sense, there was nothing special about any of these places. But if we go to the next picture, uh, by visiting, it really helped me to get a picture of what it meant when people traveled 12 miles across the moors and the hills to get to a church meeting in the middle of winter. And if there's one thing about Lewis, it's, it's rather gusty up there. <laughs> if you've not read anything about what happened on Lewis, I would strongly encourage uh, picking up a book or, or going to visit for yourself. I can, I've got a book I can lend if anyone wants it uh, today. Now, as we've entered into 2024, um, my mind has been just dreaming again. I sense that we're in a shift for us as a church, that there's been a season shift. Not just changing calendar year, but I just sense that there's been a shift for us as a church as we enter into this year. 
Of course, I ask you to weigh that up for yourself. I'm, I'm kind of sharing today something that's not fully formulated, so just kind of bear with me. I'm trying to articulate something that I've been sensing. There's been one word and one phrase which um, have just been in my heart and on my spirit um, as I ask God about what he's doing in this time. So the first word we'll put up on the screen, nice big word, the word is renewal. Now, talking of the, the word revival can have a range of reactions within us. Um, it can, the word revival comes with a lot of baggage. It comes with a lot of, um, I'm not sure about that, or I'm excited about that. Everyone has a different response. Sometimes what happened on Lewis was called a revival, sometimes an awakening, sometimes just a move of God. I actually don't think the terms really matter. They're just us trying to describe something. Uh, revival isn't actually necessarily a biblical word, but it can be a helpful term. But I think that there's a much more important term which is mentioned in the Bible, and it's this term, renewal. Renewal is when we ask the Spirit to come and make us new. It's the inner work of the Holy Spirit to infuse us, to motivate us, to help us to live out this life in all its fullness that Jesus promised us. Renewal is a biblical term. You know, Paul encourages us to be renewed in the spirit of our minds in Ephesians or to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. David prayed, God, renew a right spirit within me. And then we're going to put this verse up from Titus um, on the screen. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing and rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs and have the hope of eternal life. So renewal is something that the Holy Spirit does within the life of a believer. He works to infuse our lives with power and strength and peace. Now, I don't exactly know how all of this works, but I have found this a, a helpful model I'm going to put up on the screen, which has got some wonderful circles. Renewal is God's Spirit at work within our inner being. And then I came across this definition from a, a pastor called Mark Sayers, and he says, revival is when renewal goes viral. And I like that. Revival is when renewal goes viral. And then beyond that, we're not going to talk about that today, beyond revival, there's reformation and renaissance. That's when uh, the Spirit of God begins to shape society and the arts and culture and all of that. But coming back to the heart of it all, the heart of what God does in these significant times is renewal, the personal revival of individual hearts. And I don't know about you, but that's something that in this year I'm really just longing for. Because there's been, I said to you, there's been a word and there's been a phrase. The word is renewal, and the phrase that, that kept jumping into my mind is this, you do not have because you do not ask. Now, in case, you, in case you think I'm really clever, that doesn't come from me, that's in the Bible. You do not have because you do not ask, as in James 2, uh, so James 4, verse 2. And the, the Bible is full of this command to ask, and it sounds so obvious. You don't have because you don't ask. It can't be that simple, surely. Surely it's much more complicated and we've got to figure out the exact formulas and we've got to structure ourselves correctly and we've got to have our hearts in the right posture and we've got to just be ready for God to do something. What if it's as simple as asking? Is it not all by grace? Returning to the events in Lewis in 1949, Again, there's so much I could say about the, how God moves sovereignly and seemed to just impact lives directly without there being a human mediator. People being directly impacted. However, it's very easy to overlook how things began on Lewis. The context was the church was struggling. Uh, the young were disinterested in church. There was a lot of kind of vague spirituality and cultural Christianity. And the church started to realize this. So they, they did what the churches did in those days and they put out a public letter 
saying to congregations, it's time to examine ourselves. Basically, guys, we need to, we need to look at what, how we're living our lives if this is the state of the church. And there were two ladies that took this very seriously indeed. And if we go to the next slide. In the middle there is uh, Duncan Campbell, who is the, the minister who got called to the island to begin preaching. On, on, on either side of him, we've got Peggy Smith, who was 84, and her sister, Christine Smith, who was 82. When they saw this publication that went out, they decided that's not okay. They began to pray. They had a little humble cottage, and from it they decided that twice a week, from 10 p.m. till 3 a.m., they were going to pray, and they committed to that. They were going to pray for God to bring the change that they wanted to see. One of the nights, the sisters had a vision of the church overflowing with young people and a man that they did not recognize in the pulpit. And they shared this with their minister, who then the minister then gathered his elders, and they began praying regularly as well. And in one of those prayer meetings, a young man uh, fell into a trance and then began re uh, reciting Psalm 24. A sense of holiness fell over that meeting, and it began to spread out into the community. And this event set into motion the call for Duncan Campbell to come to the island. I'm kind of skipping over some details here. Duncan got called to come to the island, and 10 days later, he shows up, uh, meets in that church building I showed you in Barvis, and he, uh, they have a nice prayer meeting. It's quite full. There's a few hundred people there. Um, but it was just a nice meeting. It felt like just like a normal meeting. But when they went to leave, they discovered there were now 600 people outside the church building. 600 people had showed up, and this began the whole move of God on the island. And it was significant. But it began with the response of those two sisters. Rather than complaining about the island, they actually did something. They asked. They prayed. They had an earnest and deep care for their island and for the people off the island. They saw young people turning away from God, and they didn't just accept it and go, well, that's just the way culture's going these days. They saw apathy in the church and they didn't go, that's just the way people are. Two ladies in their 80s were heard by God and thousands of people benefited from their boldness. Now, and, and what I find fascinating is that their, the response was a direct answer to their prayers. When you look at the revival and you see how many young people were impacted, it's because they prayed that there was young people not engaged in the church. They saw apathy in the church, and then what became this spiritual fervor birthed on the island. I seriously doubt that anything like what happened would have happened without these ladies simply asking. You do not have because you do not ask God. Now, I find this personally deeply challenging. <laughs> I don't know about you. Am I simply too comfortable with the status quo? Have I settled for something a little bit less than what's on offer? Uh, Leonard Ravenhill, who's always a very blunt uh, uh, person to quote, but he says, the only reason we don't have revival is because we're willing to live without it. And I'm, so I'm asking myself some bigger questions this year. We'll put them up on the screen. These are the questions I'm asking myself and maybe you find yourself asking yourself too. Am I content with just simple Christian activities alone? It's easy enough for me to busy myself with good Christian activities, many of which just feel fine without the fresh breath of God. Or am I actually longing for God's presence? Is nice services and good community the high watermark of what we're about? Or is it about God, his presence in our midst? Am I serving in my own strength or in God's strength? We all have a natural leaning towards being comfortable and predictable. It's human nature. Secondly, have I become familiar with lack? Have I just become too used to the way things are, the, the things I don't have, the things I don't see God doing? Have I become too used to it? Am I okay living a life with less power than I see in the Bible? Am I okay with my own relationship with God? Have I decided this is just where I settle? Have I become too, too used to lack? 
Am I satisfied with earth when heaven is on offer? Thirdly, do I care about, my, about the spiritual condition in my area? This is one of the things that really strikes me about these two ladies. Like, they took ownership of their area and said, this isn't okay. We want to see God do something significant. Am I okay with the poverty and the social issues? Am I okay with young people growing up uh, with no knowledge of God? One of the things that marks what happened in Lewis was that one generation took very seriously the call to pass something on to the next generation. And that challenges me. Am I too busy to seek God? Is my life too full of good things at the expense of God things? Is my schedule so chaotic that God would actually have to zap me with a lightning bolt to get my attention? Now, these are the questions that provoke me deeply, and I don't stand here with the answers or having figured this out. But these are the questions I've been provoked with this year. And my goal isn't to paralyze us with these questions, but to see them as an invitation. Because the answer to all of these things is not to busy ourselves with more activities. It's simple. My message today is really not all that complicated. We'll put it on the screen here. Will we be a people who are willing to ask God for more? That's, that's all I'm asking. Will we be a people who are willing to ask God for more? Luke chapter 11, um, we've got the words here from the Lord's Prayer. I'm not going to read it all just for the sake of time, but we're familiar with the Lord's Prayer. It's about, it is fundamentally about asking God. And just after it, in verse 5, Jesus gives us these illustrations. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine is on a journey, has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me, the door is already locked, my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and go on knocking. Don't be weary. When we ask, we receive. When we seek, we find. When we knock, the door is opened. I love in the story that phrase, as this translation NIV puts it, because of your shameless audacity. What if we had a little bit more of that shameless audacity? To ask, to dare to ask. Little old us, what if we just dared to ask? I think God is just literally waiting, like, come on, guys, just ask me. Ask me to do something. Ask me to move. He's longing to move. And if we're any doubt of his character, that last section there tells us he's a good father. When we ask, he gives us good things. Maybe we're just a bit too polite. We need a bit more of that shameless audacity. I think God wants us to dream bigger, to stop being polite and just ask him for what we want him to do. And now for those of you paying attention, uh, you might see the tension in what I shared last week and what I'm sharing today. So last week I talked about the importance of giving thanks in all circumstances. And today I'm telling you, ask for more. I actually don't think there's a, there's a tension here. Both of these things are equally true. Our thankfulness, when we are thankful towards God, it, it, it's a worship to him. We get to know what his character is like as we worship him. And the God we worship is a generous God. 
So the more we worship him, the more we direct our hearts to giving thanks towards him, the more we realize he's so generous that he's waiting for us to ask. The result is we ask for more. So our, our, we, I think the Christian life is to live both thankful in all circumstances, but in a sense, be completely dissatisfied with all that we've seen and ask for more. And it's not selfish to ask God for more. In fact, actually, nothing could be less selfish than for you to ask for the Spirit to move in your life, in the life of our community. I'm just struck by that phrase at the end there, um, which I think we've got on a slide, Phil. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So the call today is just to ask him. <laughs> and, and sometimes when it comes to prayer, we actually think we've already asked him and we haven't. We've just thought about asking him. Or we've thought about what it would be like to ask him. We haven't quite gone to the actual asking phase. <laughs> or sometimes when we're worried, I was talking about someone just the other week, um, we think that we're praying, but we're just worrying. We think we're praying, but we're just recounting back to God the things that we see that are wrong. And there's nothing wrong with talking to God about our worries or our concerns. But if, what if rather than just telling him about our worries and our concerns, we actually asked him to do something about it? What if we asked him, oh God, this place is dark. People are turning away from God. The, the schools are not open to Christianity anymore. Don't stop your prayer there. <laughs> God, do something about it. God, bring your light. Bring people in this area back to you. Open the schools to be a place for Jesus. Wishful thinking is not the same as prayer. Just ask him. He's your father. How much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The promise of scripture, this phrase comes up a few times, how much more, Jesus is trying to get that phrase over in the gospels, how much more, more than you think or ask or imagine, as Paul says, more than you've dreamt, more than you have ever even dared to ask him, that's how much he wants to do. In over the top ways. You want to be renewed by the Spirit, I'll give you more than you ever asked. More than you ever expected. So I believe um, this season shift has happened for us as a church. Uh, I believe there's an invitation in this time to ask God to bring renewal to our church. And it doesn't begin with the person next to you, it begins with you. It begins with you saying, God, I, I need that. I actually need the work of your spirit to come and renew me. I want to live in that place of life and freedom and joy that you promise. We want to see the spirit healing and prophesying and, and speaking to us, helping us to live holy lives before him. The spirit birthing spontaneous and authentic worship in our hearts. That growing sense of heaven all around us, filling us with joy and peace and strength a renewed church bubbling over with the power of the Spirit. And I believe that's the invitation that God's giving us in this season. And so it's a simple thing. Do you hear that invite? Because God's, God's a good father. He doesn't force himself on anyone. He's not going to just like suddenly zap you while you go about your day. He actually wants you to ask him. It's always an offer because I believe God has never turned off the tap of renewal. I don't think God's sitting up in heaven going, a little bit, no, you can just get a little drop out here, a little drop out here. I actually think the tap's always full on. We just block it sometimes. We say, no, thank you, God. Actually, this far and no further. I don't want it. I don't believe that we see these seasons of God moving in, 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 in our world. And I don't believe it stops because God just went, well, you've had enough fun now. I actually believe that he's always waiting to bring renewal, but he's waiting for a people who are prepared to ask him. 
So I'm asking God personally at the moment to do that in my life. I'm asking him to renew me, to come in power uh, by his spirit to renew me. I don't want to do things in my own strength. I want to do it in the power of the spirit. And the truth is that this, is, this being renewed by the Spirit is something we all need as Christians on an ongoing basis. Ephesians talks about go on being filled by the Spirit. Go on being filled. Life drains us. Things happen. We get busy. Situations at home, relationships, difficult things, they all drain us. But the Spirit's here to bring life today. So today... I, I don't think we're going to finish with a song today. I think we're just, going to, um, we're just going to do it now. We're just going to invite the Spirit to do what he's already been doing in our service to, to begin to touch lives. And I want us to take a little bit of time, and there's no pressure, but I just want us, if you want to experience more of that renewal of the Spirit, I just want to create a space for that today. So if you're able, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to just spend a few minutes just just praying and just asking the Spirit to come. And you don't need to be nervous if this isn't something you're familiar with. God is good. He loves you. He cares for you. He knows you. But I do believe that God wants to touch lives today. And when the Spirit comes, we sometimes feel something and we sometimes don't feel something. Either way is fine. But for those of you who experience something, sometimes when the Spirit falls, we, we sense um, just that, that kind of anticipation within ourselves or sometimes we feel a peace come upon us or sometimes um, we feel something physically in our body. We feel our hands shake or we feel um, something happen. All of that is perfectly normal and if you feel nothing, that is also fine. Don't go on some sort of mission to find out why. You're absolutely fine. But I just want to pray now and invite the Spirit to come. And if, if that's something on your heart today, if God's been stirring something in you, then, then just lay hands on yourself as I, as I pray. So Holy Spirit, we just give you permission to come in this place. Let's just wait a minute. Yeah, Holy Spirit, come in this place. We just pray for your renewing touch. Just pray for you just to come, Father, just come and just bring your gentle spirit. Just touch hearts right now. Since there might be a few people who just feel like it's almost like their heart beating a bit faster. And um, again, I might be wrong, but just sense there might be some people who feel their hands getting a bit hot right now, like a kind of heat on your hands. If that's you, then I just feel like God's saying, um, I've anointed these hands to heal. So Holy Spirit, just come. Renew us, God. Wake us up where we've been sleeping. Stir us up where we've been um, sitting back, God. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Just wait a little bit longer. I feel like God's given the gift of wisdom to some people in this place today. Just you're thinking, I don't know how I'm going to approach the coming week, but I just pray. I just I feel the Lord just like dropping wisdom.
Holy Spirit, come in power in this place. Come in power in our lives. Renew us by your Spirit, Lord. Renew us. We ask you, God, to move. We ask you to move in our lives. We ask you to move in our community, God. We ask for your sovereign hand to come and make a difference in our community. We're not satisfied with the, the things we learn from history, God. We ask today, why not today? Why not now? Why not here? We ask you to move, God. We pray in boldness that you would move powerfully in our church and in our communities, God. Let it spill out. Let it bubble over. Let our lives be changed. Let our neighbors' lives be changed. God, I pray that you would move powerfully, that this week we would see testimony of what you've done today, that we would see uh, something ignited within us by the power of your spirit, God.